Good afternoon. Here we are on Table Talk on this hot Friday, praying for rain, waiting for it. Maybe by the time we're done, we'll see some uh, drops falling from the sky. We're, um, we're continuing to prepare for Sunday, and I just wanted to mention to you, if you haven't registered for Sunday and you're interested in doing that, would you contact either Gary Prickett or myself by email? We'd be glad to make sure that you're registered and that we take care of you. Um, we are beginning the book of Titus uh, this Sunday, and over the next almost two months, uh, I guess it'll be about seven or eight weeks, we'll go through the book of Titus, an incredibly practical book about gospel living uh, with, with gospel thinking. And so uh, I hope that you'll enjoy that. This Sunday, uh, we have a guest who's going to start us off. His name is Reese Plant. Reese is from West London Alliance. He is preparing to go to Scotland to plant in the schemes, which are uh, the schemes are uh, kind of your inner city type of rough neighborhood areas. And so he's going with a ministry called 20 Schemes and uh, a very effective ministry that's been reaching out to the downtrodden in Scotland. So we'll look forward to meeting Reese and uh, hearing God's words uh, preached from Titus chapter one. Today we wanted to, uh, Luke and I are just gonna have a bit of a conversation. We've, we've been uh, just wanting to communicate what's it like on a Sunday morning behind the scenes. We've used a lot of technology. Getting used to talking to a camera has been, uh, it's been a bit of a learning curve for me. Uh, now after almost three and a half, almost four months, it's a little more natural to do this. But I don't know that it ever has been totally natural, Luke. No. Uh, but uh, that's why I'm glad to see people on Sunday mornings. Uh, we wanted to think about how, what does Sunday morning look like? And then just talk about practically, what, what does technology look like? And, and Paul says to Timothy, he tells him, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And we've tried to use the technology here at the church to be really disciplined. Luke, what Sunday morning looked like when, when we went from the current setup where we were gathering 180 to 200 people on a Sunday morning to five of us, what's it look like for you? Yeah, a lot changed when we moved to, to live streaming to a, a primarily digital platform rather than primarily a platform here in person. Thankfully, and we've talked many times about this, that the Lord really set us up properly ahead of time for something like that, we had the opportunity and the ability to live stream. We had been live streaming your sermons up to that point, but there were a number of changes that needed to happen for us to be able to live stream an entire service. Uh, for, for those of you at home who maybe caught the first couple of live streams, there were many, many hiccups to work out. One big one that none of us thought about was sound. It's one thing to, to film and to record one person speaking. That's fairly easy. That's not too difficult to do. But suddenly when you have an entire worship team, when you have music and when you have announcements and when you have preaching, uh, that suddenly gets a lot more difficult. And so the, some of those first weeks were, were a little bit rough on, on the ears, a little bit rough on the speakers. But uh, taking time to, to research and to figure out how how live streaming and sound technology can work together uh, took some time, but I think had some very helpful results. So that was that was a big thing, and really just learning about what the, the limits of our streaming technology were. When we were just streaming a sermon, we could kind of get away with just very very easy, very simple things. When suddenly you have to be moving the camera and doing lots of other things, it had it adds to the complexity of the process. And so it was a lot of learning. It was a lot of research. It was a lot of kind of learning as we go. And there were all sorts of little weird mistakes and little strange idiosyncrasies that we kind of worked out over time and to where now it took a couple of months, but we're really in a place now where it's going fairly smoothly and kind of working the same way each week, but it certainly takes time to develop new routines like that. Yeah, we had to, I know we were looking into cables so that we could connect the iPad to the soundboard so that yeah. we had that direct sound. I know that um, 
you were the one Sunday all of a sudden we found that we were locked out of uh, multi platforms and yeah. we had planned to stream to YouTube and Facebook at the same time and suddenly that Sunday morning we went from Friday it worked to Sunday it didn't work and we were locked yeah. out um, so I know you've done a great job in terms of uh, being helping us to adapt and it's taken a lot of flexibility from mm. each of us so I'm, I'm thankful and I don't know how much people at home would realize uh, but yeah on on behalf of everyone in the congregation thank you for serving because uh, to be quite honest I don't know that any of us on staff um, really were were able to do go beyond the basics so so um, you and I haven't chatted about what we've we've kind of got a basic idea of what we're going to talk about today but I, I didn't ask you this question beforehand what got you interested into these aspects of video technology and sound technology. I, I know that at your church uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, you were involved with the sound ministry. But for sure, what what got you interested in in kind of this video and sound production that we've been doing? Yeah, I've I've always had an interest in technology from a very a very young age. Though I've never I've never had the money to be very into technology. You know, with all the the fancy new toys, I've always really had an interest in it and particularly in sound technology. So I, I was a, a musician for many, many years, loved music and particularly loved the technical aspect of that, the technology and the gear and particularly recording music and doing live production and those, those types of things. So really my foot in the door into this kind of technological realm was sound, for sure. I loved recording my own music and learning about how that process went. I still still love stuff like that. And the, the video production was more of a, a thing that came to me out of necessity. So the, the sound, sound technology, I felt great doing one of my roles in my previous church, as you said, was kind of overseeing the, the sound ministry, training other volunteers, things like that. And that's a, a place that I love to be. For, for a long time as a young man, I, I thought I preferred to be on stage playing music. And uh, it, through, through a journey of learning about what pride looks like in being a musician on stage and being, being humbled by the Lord in many ways, I, I actually came to learn that uh, I like being at the back, I like being behind the scenes and where, where nobody really sees me. That's a, that's a good place for for me to be in many ways. And so, my my love of sound kind of helped me have enough of a background to be able to then do do video and to be working on things like streaming and all that. Though it's, it's less of an area of my expertise and took took maybe more effort and more work on my part and more making mistakes and learning as well. Well, I know that when we were uh, in the hiring process for a children's ministry director, we weren't anticipating having a skill set of uh, sound and, and video production. And so, you know, I, I am continually amazed at how gracious God is in terms of, number one, the timing, uh, you coming onto staff and enabling us to be effective with children's ministry, but then children's ministry suddenly shutting down in, in a lot of ways, and I know you've tried to keep connected with families through those resources, um, but then to have those gifts and abilities and that you use them to really enable us to move to uh, a very quick, efficient online ministry when we weren't expecting that. Like, I praise God for that. I know that, I know that you've thought a fair bit about just kind of some biblical basis of, uh, of of how a Christian should think about technology. What what kind of things? What kind of thoughts or biblical principles have have guided you when when we're thinking about um, the use Christians' use of technology and and how a, a Christian should approach how how we should approach especially the internet and its massive influence on our lives. Yeah, we've learned certainly over the last couple of months, that technology is, is a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful gift. It is a piece of human ingenuity that comes from our being made in the 
the image of God and having his mind and his creativity, all those things. Technology is in many ways an invaluable tool that we, we should be very, very thankful for. But it is also one that has its own risks and its own dangers. And one of the Bible passages that always stands out to me when I'm thinking about technology, I've maybe even said this before on camera, um, is in First First Corinthians 6. Now, the, the Bible, of course, in many ways, it does not speak directly to the use of technology. We live in a very different world uh, than, than Paul did in the first century, but there are, there are principles, I think, that we can see in Scripture that we can extrapolate to the modern day and to new technologies that weren't available at the time. So in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verses 12 and 13, actually part, particularly verse 12, Paul writes, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. And this, this passage, along with uh, many other in scriptures speak to the idea that there, there are many good things, many good gifts in the world that can easily become idols if we're not careful. And Paul specifically speaks about things which can be dominating. Now, you know, as I mentioned before, Paul is not speaking about the internet here. He's not speaking about iPhones here. But in many ways, that the concept of not being dominated by, by anything, whether it is technology or whether it's something else is very relevant, I think. Many many of the, the pieces of technology that we use, whether they're physical devices or whether they're websites or apps or social media platforms, are designed to be dominating. They are, hmm. they are actually created to hold your attention, to grab your attention from companies that make money with advertising. They want you to stay on their website as long as possible. And so many, many pieces of software are designed to, in a way, be mildly addictive. To You, you always want to refresh your inbox and see if there's a new message. You want to refresh your post and see if more people have, have liked it or commented on it. And the, the reason that works is because our brains like to give us rewards. And if somebody can use that process to their advantage, we can find ourselves caught up, very caught up, and for some people even even dominated by, by things that uh, we ought not to be dominated by. And so thinking about this, this concept that technology is a valuable tool, but can certainly usurp the rightful place that it should have in your life and take up too much of your energy, too much of your life, too much of your thinking, I think is very real and something that we can see is, is true of many things in, in Scripture. I, I appreciate how you're tying in both a, a scientific perspective mm -hmm. uh, on how the brain is wired along with a biblical perspective, Luke, because uh, I know you and I have chatted privately about how technology, it, it has this especially smartphones are they're designed to trigger those dopamine um, reward pleasure seeking uh, signals in the brain so that buzz of the smartphone the the pop-up that comes the notification that comes to let you know someone's commented whether it's on a social media app or a text uh, it's incredible how we've been uh, subtly uh, become accustomed to this on demand, you're always on. You're yeah. you're always having to perform, and and I appreciate you pulling up First Corinthians six because that idea of I will not be uh, I will not be mastered by anything. Here we have these little devices in our pockets. You've got yours running on the timer there, and and I've got mine in my in my pocket here. And it's amazing how I came to realize I've got to shut off text uh, message notifications. The only thing that comes through on my phone is uh, really a phone call now because otherwise my phone was buzzing all the time. Yeah. So, so I, I think of how we, we've, got, we've got kids, uh, teenagers, who they're using these devices. They're incredibly de addictive, and I don't know that people realize how addictive they can be. P parents and grandparents can complain about, oh, my kid sits at the table or somewhere, and they're just scrolling 
uh, all through their phone all the time. I don't have any of their attention. Um, so what kind of, you, you, you talked a little bit about we're made in the image of God. We're, we're to be creative in our, our use of technology. So, so how, how might someone then be mindful of both the, the good, we've, we've been given a, a good gift by God, technology is intended to serve us, but yet at the same time it's addictive. How, how, would, you, how would you counsel some, someone, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's, maybe it's a teenager, what, what would you say to them in, in terms of balancing out both God being good and giving good gifts and yet sin being real and, and that these things are, are used to master us? How, how would you counsel someone? Yeah, I think the, the first the first and honestly most important thing is to just be aware, is to, to educate yourself about things like this. It, it's often been said that for, for those of us in generations that sort of didn't have the internet at one point and then did afterwards, we, we were those who were kind of blazing the trail. We were going into the unknown. We didn't know what problems, what pitfalls were to await us, and we're, we're the ones in many ways who are falling into all the traps and figuring out where all the problems are, and that you, that is the case with, with any new endeavor, with any new technological frontier, um, but still so many, it seems, are just simply not aware of these problems. It's become normal for for younger generations, especially for children who, who grew up from day one with the internet and with smartphones, it really does just seem like a given fact of life. The way social media is used, the way technology is used across the culture is just seen as a normal thing. And very few think about or realize the way that the purveyors of technology can use it to manipulate and to, to really further their own ends, which usually involves the making of money at some point or another. And so really just the awareness to, to even know that maybe the status quo isn't the healthiest place to be, I think is a great place to start. And really, and just having open conversation about that. What, what really struck me was when I learned that uh, most social media, things like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, especially on phones, your, your vertical scrolling feed that you refresh by pulling down operates on the exact same principle as a slot machine. Every time you, you pull down, you're pulling the lever on the slot machine, and sometimes there's a reward and sometimes there's not. And that, that is an incredibly addictive thing, as we know. In many ways, the, the person sitting there mindlessly refreshing Instagram, mindlessly refreshing Facebook, is the same thing is happening in their brain as somebody glassy-eyed at a slot machine, pulling the lever over and over again. It's, it's insidious, and I think simply the fact that we don't recognize it, we don't question it, we don't even stop to think, is this, is this normal? I think just simply not accepting it as normal on its face and being aware that it is a potential difficulty is, I think in this case, knowledge is power. That's, that's helpful. There, there definitely has been a lot of social science studies on uh, is Google making us stupid? Uh, we, we're more prone, I think, to go to Google than we are to try and actually think through something. There's the blessing of I can go and find a YouTube video on how to do something. It's instructive. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I, I've lost the ability. I think we, this is not personally, but as a culture, how, how to look at something and think through details. I know we're easily distracted. The art of reading a chapter of a book for many people is hard now. Yeah. It's harder than what it was five, maybe ten years ago because uh, they they're they're prone to look at their phone halfway through or even halfway through a page, let alone halfway through a chapter. Um, I, I wanted to recommend. I, we're we're running out of time here. These conversations are always there's so much more we can talk about. I wanted to recommend one resource, and that's um, this book by Andy Crouch. I read it a couple of years ago. It's called uh, The Tech Wise Family, 
Everyday Steps for Putting Technology in Its Proper Place. And Andy Crouch is a, an incredible thinker as a Christian who looks at how we are made in the image of God, things, Luke, that you've talked about. And so we ought to be careful that our homes are designed for creativity, not consumption, that technology, especially screens, are designed to draw us in, whether it's TVs, computers, laptops, smartphones, uh, ta tablets of all kinds. These things draw us in to consume, whereas if we can use these things to um, create, that's a great blessing. I know Andy Crouch talks about they encourage baking, they encourage playing music, playing games. They, they've tried to make their kitchen and living space on their main floor someplace that can just be a, a distraction-free zone where you can develop relationships, make connections. I think also recognizing how technology can screens and personalized devices can pull us apart so that I have my experience, I have my music, I, have, I, have, I can watch my show without regard to anybody else around me. So all of those things are really helpful. Uh, Luke, if, if you were to recommend for people, I don't know if there's a resource, I'm putting you on the spot yeah. here, is, if there's a resource that you'd recommend as well, something that comes to mind? Yeah, there, so for, for parents in particular, for parents thinking about their children and how they interact with technology, I, I had come across uh, a little while ago, last year, a, a whole sort of, I would call it kind of a little mini course, an online course for children called uh, Be Internet Awesome. And it's a, it's a resource for children to learn about how to think critically about the things that they see online. To think about things like uh, who is behind the information that I'm reading? Who's behind the video I'm watching? What is their agenda? Who's, who's paying for the content that I'm watching? And how are they paying for it? Things that we are learning now as a society, we need to start thinking about a lot more than we are. So Be, be Internet Awesome is a neat little resource that you can use to, to sort of kickstart teaching your children, especially young children, about, about these things. So we've, we're at uh, 22 and a half minutes. We've tried to aim for 20 minutes here on Table Talk. That's one of the things we also recognize that having limited time and time spans, we don't want to uh, pull you away. But we're so thankful for those of you who've watched Table Talk, who've encouraged us. If you have an idea for Table Talk, would you just put it uh, in the comments on Facebook? Or if you're watching on YouTube later on, would you just send us an email? either to myself personally or to Gary or to Luke, and we'd be glad to incorporate those ideas. We're looking forward to Sunday, worshiping the Lord together. Titus 1, we're going to be in God's Word with Reese Plant, and we'll be looking at gospel, uh, gospel thinking for gospel living. And so I hope to see you Sunday. If you haven't registered and you want to, registration is closed, but email um, myself or Gary will take care of you. And we look forward to seeing you and seeing your face. If you're coming and you know it's hot outside and you want to stand outside and visit with people with that social distance, would you consider bringing an umbrella just to shield yourself? It might be a chance of rain on Sunday. We're praying for rain. So um, just one thing to consider for the weekend. Until Sunday, the Lord bless you and keep you. And may his face shine upon you. God bless. Bye Have now. a great weekend.